say good morning. Okay, good morning. Hello, it's me. This is the graphic novel class at the University of Mary Washington, and I am looking weirdly kind of washed out today. So I don't know what's up with my the white balance on this camera, but I'm afraid to adjust it because sometimes it will um, freeze and then I have to restart. <laughs> Speaking of technological awkwardnesses, um, oh, and look, yeah, it looks like I'm slightly chroma keying out, so that's interesting too. <laughs> My hair is kind of slightly translucent. Uh, that's all right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about Stuck Rubber Baby. You're going to be listening, I guess, uh, but we will be talking about it in person on Wednesday or Friday or online, and so uh, that's what I intend to spend most of the time on today's stream talking about and doing, uh, introduce this book to you and Howard Cruz, the author, artist of this book and talk about some of the background and some of the things that will help us get into it a bit. So yeah, please say hi on the stream if you are, if you're watching, please say hi either in the Twitch chat or in the Discord chat. So if you remember, if you're in the Discord chat, you'll show up right here above me. Um, but that's just a way to kind of help me keep track of who's here and who's not and uh, make sure people are, are keeping up with things. Um, speaking, of, speaking of things, <laughs> class things, uh, a couple of reminders. First of all, your webcomic should be ongoing at this point. Uh, in fact, I should take a look at those and see how they're doing. I'll, I'll pull that up in a moment. Uh, before that, though, I just wanted to mention, um, I think uh, last week's activity went pretty well. I think the um, uh, I asked you all to share some slides and, uh, I mean, do some research and then share some slides to share that research. Um, even And I even extended that request to uh, the Teen Titans who are doing things online. So thanks, Teen Titans. I think I just saw you post yours or you were getting ready to. Let me see if you've got that out. So, oh yeah, you do, cool. Okay, so let me see if I can pull it up here and see what you did. Um, the point of this activity, by the way, was to give you all a bit more of a directed activity, like something more than just talk about it. I mean, talking is great, um, reflecting is great, but actually doing a dedicated um, uh, act an activity that results in a product, uh, I think is pretty useful sometimes. So um, I haven't seen this yet, obviously, you just now shared this, so. I, I don't know, um, but it looks like you got a video. And probably the point in this, to go back a, a little bit to March, is that um, we want to understand the actual historical context of these events, and this kind of research connects you to that context in different ways. We see a version of it in March, and part of what I want us to understand is the ways that Nate Powell's way of drawing creates a version of those events that emphasizes John Lewis's point of view. So we hopefully see that in, in comparing it with other things, like looking at things that are from the same time period about the same events but depicted in different media or recalled um, in different ways. So a lot of um, pretty cool uh, images of course and yeah this is uh, an image that you can definitely see. Like I, I shared the other image of this bus uh, that is the basis of the image that's the cover for March book two and then pages what is it, I want to say 44 and 45 of that book, something like that. Um, but the, the woman seated on the grass in front, you actually see her in a slightly different pose, but in, in that panel. So it's an interesting way that he, Nate Powell's kind of combined those two images. Um, and then, oh yeah, okay, here we go. So here's the Montgomery scene. So this is pretty cool. It'd be nice to juxtapose this with the actual March imagery, which I don't have close enough for me to reach without disconnecting my microphone, so uh, I won't pull it up. But I do remember some similar images and scenes of the crowd kind of at, right at the station like that, so that's pretty cool that you're able to find that. Um, and of course, as I, I think you've discovered based on this link here, that location is now a, um, a museum. So uh, that location is a museum about the Freedom Riders. So it's actually um, physically there and preserved to preserve this the history of this horrible event, basically, but also the, the history of this um, a tremendously influential and important event in the civil rights movement. So it's actually, it, it's a pretty cool thing that that becomes a site, but then we actually get to preserve that, you know, the 1960s architecture of that bus station and, and kind of how it looks. So that's uh, that's pretty cool that you're able to find all that. So thanks Teen Titans for putting that together. Um, and also thanks for all the other groups for putting your work together. Um, again, understanding historical context is important. Um, and it's also important for Stuck Rubber Baby, even though this is a, a work of fiction, it starts off uh, in the first couple pages referencing the uh, lynching of Emmett Till. And so it's definitely set in the civil rights movement amid some of the conflict and the violence of that era. So it's something that, I mean, I put these two books together on purpose or you know, adjacent to each other in the syllabus uh, on purpose. And I think, uh, think you can see why. Uh, okay, so let's take a look before I get into Stuck Rubber Baby. Let me see how you're doing on your uh, webcomics. I haven't checked today, so. 
hopefully we've got a few new updates uh, by now maybe let's find out what's going on with the COVID crushers and I believe I should have all the, the links should all be correct now uh, so COVID crushers looks like you're still on number one so you know remember I don't know what your schedule is I don't remember but uh, you want to make sure you get this up there but I think you know overall you're doing a nice job with the lettering that's the thing I always pay attention to and um, yeah it looks like you're setting up a conflict nicely with the uh, incoming virus yeah. uh, very realistic and how is Halloween I I I'm for I definitely fixed this link I 100% did this already so what has happened why has it gone back <laughs> I definitely did this because I saw your I saw it hang on let me see if I can log in I probably can't because I keep having to reset my password because it keeps forgetting it or like you know I did uh, man, this is frustrating. Okay, let me try it. Maybe I have it on my laptop. I have three different computers that I use for this class, and so basically for the for this for WordPress sites in general, I can never get it updated in my actual password manager for some reason, or it doesn't remember it. And so it'll be things like Yeah. It'll be things like uh change your password and then I change it and then it's like it's still wrong like I give it the new one and it's like no that's not right and then I'm like yes it is and then it's like I, I use it and it's like well you can't use that one because you've already used it and it's like well you just told me to use it and it's like why do I have to keep doing this <laughs> like every other password system seems to work fine or I don't know passwords um, yeah. okay I've, I'm 100% sure that I, I edited this link to Hallows Halloween, so I don't know what's going on there. But the Instagram one to Penny and Poe is working. I'll pull this one up and take a look at it. Oh, why so serious? So we're getting dark with the imagery. <laughs> oh man. Uh, oh no. I have paint in my phone. <laughs> kind of violent here. Nice. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, oh, they have text messaging. Oh, that's great. I love it. Poke. Bong bong. Anxious. I, I just yeah very nice I mean I really like the the, the narrative that was developing I like the artwork and the color palette I really like I like the sort of watercolor tone of that um, I don't know if this this is probably I don't know if this is intentional or not but this image here sort of reminds me of one let me see if I can find it real quick um, Donald, of a Donald Duck comic uh, um, um, yeah, this one. I, I mean, not obviously not very much, but like the idea of uh, the uh, the, the setting, like the the room, and then the table, and then uh, something next to it. This looks like a similar pose. This is another image, by the way. Uh, if you recall, looking at the vacation time, Carl Barks uh, vacation. Time, this is another Carl Barks cover, and it has a similar set of interdependent. Um, lookings or ways of looking that don't actually add up in a Euclidean geometric sense but they actually they look great I mean it's it's Carl Barks ability to cohere right like so the it, so one of the examples for example for, uh, Donald is looking down across the table at this slice of pumpkin pie um, that uh, first of all you shouldn't be able to see at that angle also this nephew is cutting it out but it's already cut out and this nephew is um, enjoying it even though he hasn't eaten it yet and there's all these ways in which like it doesn't really make sense but it does make it makes great cartoon sense so that's a uh, best Karl Barks is um, the subtlety of Karl Barks art anyway just kind of not super related obviously but just this, this table and like the, uh, the pumpkins on it sort of reminded me of that uh, okay so good job uh, let me see I, I know the links to uh, let's see if I can find it I mean I mean it's just or if anyone's in the Hallows Halloween that can share your link I I think it's like this, something like that. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay, good. So this is their their dis, their um, Instagram. I'll just put it in Discord in case you want to see it. And I I will try again to fix it. I don't know what the heck is going on there, but um, yeah. Do let's see, pumpkin. Do you think we have enough candy? You're using Comic Sans, which is a risk. I should say I don't totally recommend it, um, but that's all right. Uh, it it does match uh, five bags. That's right, you can always save it. That's a good idea. Oh, what's Jackal doing? Is Jackal the cat? Oh, he ate the candy. 
<laughs> I think, right? Yeah, he's gonna feel bad later. Um, they shouldn't, uh, cats shouldn't eat candy. Um, I have figured out my, um, I got my, my catapult uh, working. Uh, so I'm going to, I'll show you that once I get that uh, decorated. The, um, it's, um, it's coming along, but it's, uh, I, I have a couple of, couple of tweaks to make it. Um, the, um, <laughs> okay, so he doesn't want to put, so wait, okay, which one is his costume? So Sleepy has tell me what this is, so we, I thought that, oh, that's his costume, I got it, okay. So that's, I thought those was candy, but these are, I got it. But he's still, still, cats shouldn't eat candy. <laughs> cats, cats are great, um, but I don't really, I don't have any cats. Um, yeah, so I'll share, I'll share my, I'll show you my catapult when I get it. No pun intended. I, I'll show you my catapult when I get it done because it's it's a similar premise I think to what Hal's Halloween are working on. Uh, okay, let me take a look, look at a couple more uh, Atlas. Let's see what's going on with Atlas. They were pretty epic. Um, I believe it was nobody, and then they left. So it, it's so intense. <laughs> I like it. Um, and I think that's still your second one. And let's see how Root of All Evil is doing. Yeah, uh, again, you know, pretty dramatic setup here. And uh, we talked a little bit about some, I gave some hints about, or tips about lettering, but I think, I like what you're doing typographically, just like you have to watch the uh, the resolution. Uh, that's the main thing. So, so those should keep going. Uh, so let me know if you have any, if you run into any problems or issues, especially, you know, like working on the, your, your process, that kind of stuff can be uh, a bit of a drag sometimes. Uh, like, or it can be bogged down. Like, if you're feeling like you're bogged down in your workflow, feel free to revise your workflow or find a better way to make it work. Uh, the ones, the, the groups that are using Discord a lot, I do, I don't like watch your channels, but I do see you posting every now and then, and it seems like you're doing pretty well. Other groups, I think, are using other ways of communicating, and that's fine too. Just, you know, if you have any issues, uh, let me know, and I'll try to help if I can. Okay, so um, I have a slideshow about Stuck Rover Baby, and it's got some links in it and some things, so I will share this. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and share this in Slack. I mean, in Discord, and uh, in case you want to flip through it on your own, look at some of the images in more detail. Here's the slides I'm getting ready to go through. Okay, so yeah, that's a super long URL, but that's okay. Um, so stuck rubber, baby, blah, blah, stuck rubber Baby by Howard Cruz. Okay, so Howard Cruz is, uh, this is a few images of him. He uh, passed away last year. Uh, but he was influential and produced many comics over the years uh, in the in the, uh, mainly in the underground comics scene. And, and part of what I want to do to talk, today is talk about the underground comic scene and um, mention some of his involvement in that. Um, but this is him as an as a yeah as a young man on the left, and then as an older man on the right. And as you can see, he has this way of drawing himself. It's a a kind of um, a theme of like self-deprecating humor to kind of make himself look silly sometimes. Um, he most of many of his comics uh, did and deal with did and and uh, early on and even throughout his life dealt with um, uh, homosexual homosexuality and his identity. Um, he actually has a great website, so I just wanted to show you um, this howardcruz.com. Uh, obviously, this is maintained by his family or his estate now, uh, but lots of pretty cool stuff. I mean, just animated gifs, right? Um, kind of cheesy looking um, papyrus font here, but that's okay. And uh, if you, yeah, I mean, he's got sort of a blog. Um, he's got like silly gifts and um, let's see, there's a few um, comics in here. Uh, there's, there's actually quite a few comics. Actually, let me go back here. Oh, the Comics Vault, I'm sorry, that's what it's called. Um, yeah, yeah, so I just, I love this page. It's like a, um, like this wall and then there's like these boxes and you click in, click in there. Uh, pretty funny. And then uh, what you see is, what you'll find are kind of one-off comics, things that he published in different um, uh, newspapers and magazines and things like The Village Voice. Uh, there was one I really liked that I'm trying to, oh yeah, and then That Night at the Stonewall. So re uh, referencing the Stonewall riots um, or conflict, I guess. And so here's, um, here is his comic about that from 1982. And uh, it was 1969, some friends and I dropped acid that night and sprawled on the grass of Central Park for a Tiny Tim concert. Oh, I should have brought my ukulele. I could have done some Tiny Tim. Um, I know a couple of Tiny Tim songs. Uh, but this is, uh, the, uh, this is his version of the event. This, uh, the Stonewall rights have been depicted in different comics on, um, 
by different comics and have, have been written about in lots of different ways, obviously. Um, so I think this is kind of funny the way that he's presenting it. Now, again, um, I haven't really talked much about underground comics yet, but this is an example of underground comics, so pay attention to kind of the loose style of it. And also uh, bear in mind that, I guess this is a content warning, but um, underground comics frequently deal very frankly with drug use and sexuality. So that's kind of a, a thing that happens. It's not a huge emphasis here, but it's something that you will see as a, I show you some more examples. And this, it might start here. Um, as, they're rec as they're referencing, they are using LSD. So uh, afterwards, we taxied back downtown to continue our trip in the village. Uh, what I'm saying is automatic transport is just a slow form of interspatial beaming. Easy there, Captain Kirk. Say, look at all the androids on the street. Falafel, I'm starving falafel, uh, effing hippies. Um, as we ambled idly onto Christopher Street, we happened upon a disturbance. Do I see something dramatic afoot? This is his self insert, his, uh, his drive of himself. Uh, come on, Howie, let's go watch what gives. There was a furor erupting in front of the Stonewall Inn, one of my gay haunts of choice. Click here to see what was up. Um, so, interesting, far out. And then there's this riot going on, basically, and they're just sort of strolling <laughs> in the middle of it. We strolled up to the periphery of the action amid the yells, police sirens, and flying bottles, watching it all as though it were a psychedelic stage play that posed no danger to us at all. In our hallucinatory states of mind, it was hard to be sure how real the riot was or what was its significance. Uh, where were we witnessing the revolution that, have, that radicals have been predicting? Was the social order being upended? Were governments about to fall? And I, I love the artwork here, how it just combines the, the, the same black and white line art style from before with this kind of collage, multicolored technique to show the violence and things around them. Uh, we finally wandered away from, what, from the melee, not certain exactly what we'd seen or whether a whole new world had been ushered in before our eyes. And it had. Uh, and then they, there's a gay pride parade. Listen, this guy was there, uh, well, in a manner of speaking. So he's kind of, it, it's this humorous kind of there, but not really there kind of anecdote. And he's told it in comic form. Um, I also really like the way that he's adapted this, which was originally published, I think, in the Village Voice. And it's, uh, he, but he's transformed it into a webcomic and it is perfectly coherent and works well as a webcomic. Uh, it's adapted to this format very nicely. So, uh, let's see if there's any more that are you can kind of look like. Raising Nancy, this one, I, I enjoyed this one a lot too. It's pretty weird, so I don't know what to make of it. Um, but it has to do with Nancy, like from, Na from the Nancy comics, and sort of a series of running jokes about it. Um, the Nancys are these little, in this case, Nancy the character, instead of it being Nancy the character from the Nancy comics, it's these little Nancy monsters that sort of roam around his house. Um, I think it's really funny. So. There's the, um, yeah, there's, uh, it, it, these are all, all nice kind of one-off things. And I, what I like about them is that they let you in, uh, get, a, get some experience of their, uh, of his art style. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's saw some questions, but I think you all are talking to each other. So I will let you all figure that out. Um, unless, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, let's talk about, let me move on with my slides about how it grew. Okay, so uh, he was, uh, he worked in the underground comics world, uh, mainly he published a couple of comics, one called Barefoots, another one called Wendell, and these were published in different ways, but um, as kind of standalone, like full-fledged comic books, um, he was the editor, the first editor of an anthology work called Game, Gay Comics, and um, I think this is interesting. So he's the editor. He didn't do the artwork here on the left, uh, but he did have a, a comic in this issue and did several more. But this is um, this is his introduction as the editor here, and I like what he has to say. I don't know if you can read it, so um, uh, I'm not sure if I can make it bigger. But yeah, that actually that actually worked. Um, so he's saying uh, so. The kind of subtitle for this issue: Lesbians and Gay Men Put It on Paper. In this comic book, you'll find work by lesbians, gay men, and bisexual human beings. The subject is being gay. Each artist speaks for himself or herself. No one speaks for any mythical average homosexual. No one speaks for the gay movement. No one is required to be politically correct. We are individual cartoonists, complete with personal beefs, slants, insights, and blindnesses. We've tried to leave our soapboxes behind and express our humanness. In drawing this book, we gay cartoonists would like to affirm that we are here and that we live lives as strewn with India inked pratfalls, flawed heroics, quizzical word balloons, and surreptitious truths as the rest of the human race, and even a few talking animals. To put it mildly, there's more to the gay experience than can be chronicled in 36 pages. So this one's just for starters, have fun. And so this would run for, this comic would run for uh, about 10 or 11 years. Uh, he was the editor for the first uh, three years, I think, of it. Um, 
and uh, I don't think I have a slide with his actual comic from that, um, but I believe it was a, a Wendell comic, though I don't remember. Uh, actually, the table of contents is there, but anyway, well, <laughs> the, the point is he, he published this. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, oh yeah, here's a Wendell. So this is, um, I don't actually know the date for this Wendell. I, I can't see it. It might be the 1990s. Um, I, I wanted to show him Wendell because this is, of course, the same artist, Howard Cruz, but you should notice a um, pretty different style. Like, I mean, he's, he's able to draw in lots of different styles. Uh, he was a talented artist. Uh, but this is something that has um, less realism than the artwork that we see in Stuck Rubber Baby. There, there's different reasons for that, I think. Um, but I think this is actually more, more of his typical style. Like this is more what I think Howard Cruz tended to draw like. And it has a simplicity of line, but it's still very expressive. Um, it's almost like a Sunday comics style of comics. Like it's the kind of thing you would see as a you know, flat two-dimensional characters in many cases, or two-dimensional two artwork. Um, and when we get into Stuck Rubber Baby, it gets much more dense, much more, much darker um, use of uh, dots and stippling to make it look shadowy in some cases, to make things look more realistic. And I think it's an interesting choice. I think we'll we'll look at that and how that plays out in the book um, once we get to it. But this is this is Wendell. This is how he would tend to draw. Okay, so I wanted to have a little sidebar here to talk a bit about underground comics. Um, I have a few slides. I am trying to keep this PG, so some of these slides won't be super detailed or up close. But uh, I wanted to, I guess, acknowledge that and talk talk a bit about what underground underground comics are, kind of where they come from, and uh, so we can understand the significance of. Sorry, I have to open this computer again. Uh, thinking about um, Howard Cruz as an underground artist, uh, obviously Suck Rubber Baby is a book. It's published as a trade paperback with an, uh, through an imprint of DC Comics, so it is mainstream in a sense, but uh, Howard Cruz is one of many comic artists who started in the underground and then um, working on their own publishing independently in the underground community, but are now publishing or have published um, critically, critically acclaimed literary graphic novels. Uh, so uh, Art Spiegelman, who published Mouse and In the Shadow of No Towers, uh, Alison Bechtel, who did Fun Home. Uh, these are artists who got their start doing um, underground comics, and so now they are um, well known as graphic novelists, and Howard Cruz is among those. So uh, I, to give some background, though, on underground comics, I think it's useful to go back to 1954. <laughs> so. Uh, in 1954, a uh, psychologist, uh, or psychiatrist, I actually don't remember which one he is, but uh, Frederick Wortham published a book called Seduction, Seduction of the Innocent. And this is a book in which he wanted to alert America to the um, threat of comics. Yeah, exactly. Not approved, right? That was my, that was my little joke. Thanks, <laughs> Rose Tyler. Uh, so this is, uh, we'll get to the comics code in a moment. Uh, so Frederick Wortham publishes, publishes this book, for, uh, Seduction of the Innocent. There is a PDF of it in our Canvas files area if you want to look at it uh, in some detail. I think it is a book worth looking at. I think it's something that, I mean, the parts I'm going to present to you will seem sort of easy to, to dismiss as homophobic, um, and they are. However, I think understanding Wortham's point of view and his motivation, I think, is helpful to understand that it wasn't, it wasn't just this random person being homophobic in an influential way, it was an expression of kind of mainstream belief at the time. So it's not something that came out of nowhere. And it very much was a product of its time. It very much was well received at its time. It was very influential. It led to congressional hearings. So it's something that, uh, and also he testified at the Supreme Court about obscenity. Uh, this is a big deal. And so understanding it and, and looking at it is important. But you can see a couple things from this quote I have here. Um, this is uh, this is a quote from the book. I don't have page numbers because this was a, a ebook that I was taking screenshots from. Um, talking about Batman. Uh, so uh, among the things that um, Wortham was concerned about was that comics uh, being, as he claimed, artwork for children um, included all these hidden messages or coded messages to subtly influence children toward deviant behavior. Um, at this time, homosexuality was considered uh, a psychosis. So um, the idea that it was uh, a, a mental problem, it fits into the way that Wortham was talking about children being lured into this um, deviant, abnormal, abnormal psychological um, position, I guess. And so he, he's arguing that uh, Batman is doing this in a almost subliminal way. So for for Batman, 
uh, several years ago, a California psychiatrist pointed out that the Batman stories are psychologically homosexual. Our research has confirmed this entirely. Notice the confidence here. Only someone ignorant of the fundamentals of psychiatry and of the psychopathology of sex can fail to realize a subtle atmosphere of homoeroticism which pervades the adventures of the mature Batman and his young friend Robin. So notice right there, like he's stating it as a given that there is this psychopathology of sex that is that homosexuality is part of, right? That's the example of, that's what I mean by it was given as the standard, like that was the mainstream thinking about sexuality at, at the time. Uh, the, the science, and, we, and given scientific credibility, like that was the, the way you talked about it. So here's a longer quote, I don't know if I'll read this whole thing, but uh, talking, you know, expanding a little bit on the idea about Bruce Wayne and Dick uh, Grayson. Um, uh, sometimes Batman ends up in bed injured and young Robin is shown sitting next to him. At home, they lead an idyllic life. They are Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. Bruce Wayne is described as a socialite, and the official relationship is that Dick is Bruce's ward. They live in sumptuous quarters with beautiful flowers and large vases and have a butler. <laughs> sometimes, Batman is sometimes shown in a dressing gown. Um, it's like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. Sometimes they are shown on a couch, Bruce reclining and Duke, uh, Dick sitting next to him, jacket off, collar open, and his hand on his friend's arm. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it goes in some detail here, obviously, to, to explain these. And, and honest, I mean, you can find images like these are these are comics that, you know, they it's two men having, uh, you know, this partnership of where they fight crime. Right. Um, whether or not their subliminal messages is, is, of course, debatable. Um, but these are the things that Wortham is noticing and that he's uh, concerned about. He's concerned that youth are being um, pro uh, programmed by this. Right. Um, uh, the women are not immune either. So for boys, Wonder Woman is a frightening, frightening image. For girls, she is a morbid ideal. Where Batman is anti-feminine, the attractive Wonder Woman and her counterparts are definitely anti-masculine. Wonder Woman has her own female following. Uh, they are all continuously being threatened, captured, almost put to death. There is a great deal of mutual rescuing, the same type of rescue fantasies as in Batman. And it goes on a bit. Uh, so but basically, Wonder Woman is um, a lesbian with an army of lesbians that are um, anti men, like anti-masculine, like less the risk there. So it wasn't just sexuality in this book. Uh, Wortham talks about violence. He talks about um, dark, like psychological horror, um, violence, I mean, uh, crime, like the glorification of crime. Like these are all things that comics are, are doing. I mean, and in a sense, he has a point that yes, you can find evidence of this, but whether it is, whether that is um, like subliminally programming youth towards deviancy is a bit less certain, I think. Um, so that's, uh, but it still turned out to be pretty influential. So this actually, I meant to put that one here. Um, so this is, uh, sorry about the order there. So this led to the uh, series of hearings, a series of issues, um, and just to kind of oversimplify it quite a bit, the, uh, this, th what played out here was very similar to what played out in the early 90s in the video game industry. Uh, and in the film industry, and I don't remember when that was, but uh, the MPAA in film, the ESRB in video games, the Comics Code Authority, these are all industry groups that are technically opt-in. They are not government. Some people think of these as, censorship, as uh, agents or uh, institutions of censorship, but they aren't technically in the sense that these are not technically government institutions. Um, these are elective organizations that uh, publishers join and then are um, uh, publishing under. Uh, so the Comics Code Authority, this is obviously the comics one and you can see it here on the right in this Gorgo comic. Uh, the approved by the Comics Code Authority is this symbol, it looks kind of like a stamp that is printed or just it's part of the artwork of these comics to say that yes, this one has been approved, meaning it has met the standards. And so the idea was that uh, Publishers would agree to have their work approved by the Comics Code Authority, and then distributors would there would agree to to sell it, um, so that they if if a comic did not have the Comics Code Authority, they wouldn't sell it, and so therefore you essentially were not able to find an audience and sell your comics. So the Comics Code Authority is, I mean, the actual Comics Code is pretty interesting. It's here; you can read it. Um, I think some of these are pretty interesting. Uh, so it's pretty detailed in some cases. Ooh, sorry, cold chill. <laughs> it's chilly out here in this room. Uh, I don't have heat. Uh, I've, 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 uh, I'm committed not to not turn around our furnace until November 1st. So um, it's just, it's chilly. I don't have any, there's no heat out here in this particular room. Sorry. Uh, so this is, uh, it's chilly. Um, so, uh, yeah, so speaking of 
some of the things that might come up in uh, Underground Comics and Howard Cruz's comics. Uh, these are the things that are required. I thought this was actually interesting, looking at the costume, um, going back to our conversation about Miss Marvel and Kamala Khan. Uh, females, shall be females shall be drawn realistically without exaggeration of any physical qualities. Um, this is definitely something that you see slipping, um, even as works continue to at least nominally comply to the Comics Code Authority through the 1980s and 90s. Um, you certainly see females drawn increasingly less realistically, or maybe not increasingly, but you certainly see some str some strange examples of, of women drawn in ways that are not um, not accurate. Uh, the uh, but it, so thinking of sex, uh, this is the marriage and sex section. So divorce shall not be treated humorously. Illicit sex relations, uh, violent love scenes. Um, it doesn't explicitly say homosexual, but I think this is what it's being talked about here. So sexual, abno sexual abnormalities are unacceptable. Uh, also sex perversion of any, or any inference to same is strictly forbidden. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously there's, they're trying to avoid pornography, but also um, the kind of sexuality that is considered deviant or perverse is um, homosexuality. So that, that that's, that's where that shows up there. Um, I think these are, it, it's actually fascinating too, to look at how crime has to be presented, right? So uh, kidnapping shall never be, be, be portrayed in any detail, right? So we don't, we don't want to give people ideas. Um, uh, instances of law enforcement officers dying as a result of criminals' activities should be discouraged. Um, you know, and unique or unusual methods of concealing weapons. I mean, it's really pretty interesting. Like they're trying to avoid pretty specific content. Um, okay, so this, by the way, this is Gorgo. I, I don't know much about Gorgo. I just found it on that Comic Book Plus website a while ago, and I have increasingly kind of, uh, I mean, I've enjoyed the artwork of it. It's it's really silly artwork, I think, and the face of Gorgo here seems kind of like strangely goofy, and I, I don't know why. Um, actually, finally, this there, there is a movie. Like, this was a, a movie first, and then the comic was based on the movie, and I found the trailer for the movie. As it turns out, this Gorgo is actually... Uh, the mother, right? So it's kind of a, uh, a kaiju kind of thing where some di it's, there's some kind of nuclear explosion and a volcano and some divers and they capture Gorgo or they capture this monster and it's like 20 feet tall and they're like, oh, this is pretty cool and they, they capture it and then they're like, oh no, that's the baby. And then uh, the mother shows up. And so this is the mother actually. So this is a feminine kaiju. Um, anyway, so the Comics Code Authority restricts what's publishable, what can be published. And so this was a book uh, pub published by EC Comics in their weird fantasy book, which I, I really like, by the way. I've, I've been reading a lot of their the EC Comics stuff, like the creepy and the weird fantasy. Uh, really interesting, really good artwork. Um, this is an example of, this is an excerpt from a story called Judgment Day, and this was a controversial story, and you'll see why in the next slide, or maybe you, you already saw it as it blew past there. So 1953, remember this is uh, the same year as um, you know, John Lewis was working to support the Voting Rights Act. I mean, these are uh, getting you know the, the things that we think of as the Civil Rights Movement were getting started. People were um, becoming very aware of this. I think so. 1953 would have been a year or two after when was it that Martin Luther King Jr. comic published? Um, I have the link in, back here in Discord, so let me go back here and look at it. I think it was 1952. I'm blanking on it. Or no, 55. 56, sorry, so 1956. So this is, uh, you know, you can actually see sort of a similarity of art style just in terms of paneling, like lots of square panels. Uh, but this is very much where we are kind of historically. And this is a bit from this story. The basic premise is that there's this uh, astronaut who shows up on this planet full of robots and he's here from Earth. This is a planet that has been um, populated, has been seeded by Earth thousands of years ago and um, with, with uh, robotic life. And so his job, he's showing up now to see how things have, have gone for the last several thousand years of uh, evolution for these robots. He wants to see how they are and he wants to see if they are ready to join the Galactic Republic. So he's here to review their membership application to the Galactic Republic, sort of like the Federation in Star Trek, I guess. And so he's here to see what's going on. And what he has discovered in this set, set of panels is that uh, these robots have developed an advanced society. Um, they've also developed racism. And so they have uh, this segregation between orange robots and blue robots. And the, um, so Tarleton is the name of the 
astronaut and he's like, oh, you differentiate between blue robots and orange robots? Of course, otherwise there'd be trouble. We have to keep them in their place, you know? So certainly echoing the, the, the language of, the, of Jim Crow segregation. And then this is the final set of panels in this uh, story. Uh, the ship roared up into the night sky. It roared into the infinite void of space, into the endless cosmic vacuum. It roared toward glorious, toward glorious Earth. And inside the ship, the man removed his space helmet and shook his head, and the instrument lights made the beads of perspiration on his dark skin twinkle like distant stars. The end. So um, this was a controversial book because, or it became the center of a controversy because, I mean, as you can see, the character Charlton, when he reveals his, when he removes his helmet, the whole time he's been wearing a helmet. So we, we now see his face for the first time. We see that he has black skin. He's an African-American or, Af you know, uh, dark-skinned individual. And it even references that in the, the text here, right? So the beads of perspiration on his dark skin twinkle like in distant stars. Obviously, that drives home the point of this story. Obviously, that's kind of the big punch of this story is that he is able to condemn racism among these robots as someone whose heritage or is, is whose ancestors. I mean, it, it implies that the Earth is this glorious place now where this is no longer a problem. And so it's talking about this future. Uh, it, it's very much the point of the story uh, that humans in this story, in this fantasy, are are past that point. These robots are not, and that's the problem, and that's the judgment here. Like the humans are judging the robots for um, for being racist. So that's that's the the, the point. Uh, this story was initially rejected by the Comics Code Authority, and the uh, adjudicator of the, of the CCA at the time was someone named Murphy, and Murphy. Uh, asked them to rewrite the story or to, to recolor, redo that last panel so that he no longer had dark skin. Uh, I, I actually don't know. I, I actually was looking at the comics code, of the actual comics code. I don't, I don't know what code it would violate if he's black. I, I don't, I mean, except like if you look at it here, there's no, you're not supposed to ridicule or attack any religious or racial group. I don't know how that would be an attack unless it's implicitly like an attack on whiteness, which is obviously a weird argument. So I don't know. I, I, but in any case, it was considered uh, inappropriate by that, that particular judge. And so, you know, since 1953, when this was first published, uh, without the Comics Code Authority, it, the controversy came up three years later when it was um, published in a different anthology that was reviewed by the CCA. Uh, so the publishers, EC Comics, they refused to make the edits, they published it anyway, and then um, quit the comic business, basically. So EC Comics basically uh, ended at that point. Uh, Jim Gaines, or William Gaines, Gaines. The, the, the publisher of EC Comics went on to do Mad Magazine, uh, you know, obviously had a, a successful career doing other things that were comics adjacent, uh, but EC Comics as a, uh, as a company pretty much faded out. Uh, and so that was a, as a result of the Comics Code. So the Comics Code then, creates this kind of norm for sort of what comics are supposed to be like. The underground comic comics are those comics explicitly published in protest of the Comics Code Authority or really just without any attempt to meet it. You can almost say that the underground comics were, by being a reaction to the Comics Code, kind of needed the Comics Code to exist. Um, I mean, maybe that's overstating it. Maybe these things would have existed anyway. But this is just a collage of several underground comics. Uh, these the, and kind of illustrating that none of these have the CCA logo on them. And um, this is kind of an ugly collage. And I apologize. But you've got different uh, artists here that I wanted to, I guess, mention. You've got Robert Crumb, R. Crumb um, down here and up here. Excuse me, Diane Newman here. Uh, you've got um, Justin Green, Vicky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary. Uh, this is a cover by S. Clay Wilson, I think. So these are, uh, there's a kind of lurid art style. There's kind of um, references to uh, adult audiences. And you can see like for this, this is zap number one way over here in the corner. Uh, it says warning adult intellectuals only. Uh, women's comics here, it says adults only. Um, so these were definitely adult focused comics, comics where the audiences were adults. Uh, many of them by explicitly rejecting the Comics Code Authority are preoccupied with those things that the Comics Code Authority says you can't do. So preoccupied in particular with um, sex and drugs. And so there's quite a bit of it. Many, much, of, uh, much of the work under the underground comics label um, 
is arguably sim simply pornographic. And so I, that's why I'm not showing it to you, but it's also art and it can be very, very interesting and also can be very um, politically oriented and, and activist even in some cases. So uh, I think you, you see definitely uh, women's comic being an expression and a version of um, feminism. You've got, uh, uh, you know, interesting racial politics going on in some comics, like, like Howard Cruz's comics, which we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, you can find out a lot about underground comics if you if you're really interested. If you Google it, and I will kind of trust you to do that. Again, I'm, I'm trying to keep these, real, you know, PG PG thirteen. Um, it's I yeah, there are things that I would rather that I I think are interesting and worth looking at, but are kind of. Um, challenging uh that, that are you know they, they cross several lines on purpose kind of like to see what lines they can cross uh, so these are things that are not published in mainstream by mainstream publishers obviously the underground or the independent label there is is giving you that sense of uh non-standardness so these would be things that you wouldn't buy at the the bookstore or the drugstore um you would buy these at the places where you would purchase your marijuana paraphernalia or whatever uh, these are things that would be distributed in in, in the, those kinds of channels in kind of semi-legal channels but thanks to the internet you can find a lot of it online now and there are different collections uh, underground comics is a whole uh, fascinating universe and also some really brilliant artists like it's not something that just sort of is this sort of purient attempt to get away with things um, actually really amazing artwork uh, and it's uh, so it, yeah, it's interesting. So it first came up, and as, as I say, in the uh, 1960s is really when it surged in terms of responding to the Comics Code Authority, attempting to do its own thing. And um, it, it, at that same time, it was alongside and, and part of the uh, countercultural movement that was going on, and of course the civil rights movement. So uh, lots of things going on there in the 1960s. Okay, so finally, uh, stuck over baby. Um, this is the cover of the hardback version. I have uh, I have the paperback version. It's the same on the inside. I'm pretty sure. I haven't noticed any differences. Certainly, um, this is a book that is different. So, uh, this is unique among what we've looked at so far, uh, not throughout the semester, but for so far anyway. Um, this book is by a single person. So we have uh, well, I guess Donald Duck's comic. The, those Karl Barks ones were um, solely by Karl Barks, except maybe the coloring on that one we looked at. But in any case, uh, Stuck Rubber Baby, Stuck Rubber Baby uh, it's kind of like a tongue twister after a while, uh, by Howard Cruz is a book where he does the, the writing, the lettering, the artwork. And so it's a single authored work and it is very much a novel. It, it is structured like a novel. We have multiple characters. We have intersecting plot lines. It is a complete narrative where we don't have, we don't need to know anything about the characters before this. We might wonder about what they do afterwards, but I, we don't need it. It's a, it's a self-contained work and very much a work of fiction. It is published by Paradox Press, which was, or is, I don't know if they're still around, uh, an imprint of DC Comics. And, and this is kind of like, uh, like Vertigo, which is an imprint of DC Comics that publishes uh, Watchmen. It's a way to kind of say, this is us doing something a little bit more literary. And so we get to see this here. Uh, it's set in uh, Clayfield, in, which is a fictional small town in the South in the 1960s. Uh, I believe it's meant to be semi-autobiographical, but through the evidence that we have of Howard Cruz's other work, where he is saying these literally are his uh, his stories about himself, um, you can see it's not that mu that autobiographical, except in very general ways. Um, so that's uh, that's the basic setting of it. The themes are homosexual homosexuality, uh, growing up and discovering one's identity. Of course, the civil rights movement and racism and homophobia all kind of intersect in this fictional small town in the South called Clayfield, which is the 1960s. So here are just a few of these characters. I always run out of time with this part of the slideshow. I, I want to put together like a slideshow of all the characters, um, and I, I ran out of time. So I got I got three. Um, and there are many more. Uh, and I think that is part of the challenge in reading this book sometimes is the number of characters and you kind of have to keep track of who's who. Uh, certain characters change their appearance pretty dramatically throughout the book. So that's one thing you, that can be a little tricky sometimes. So um, I think I'll just, I will keep working on this slide and add some more characters, maybe make some more characters, uh, character slides just to kind of help uh, keep track of who's who. Um, I did finally get it. I downloaded a digital copy of this book so I can get um, pictures a bit more easily. So Tolan Polk is our main character, and we see him at two points in his life, or, or I guess three, but uh, it's mainly two, where he's a young man, on, as you see on the left, and he's an older man on the right, uh, re recollecting. So the book is, the narrative of the book is told to us as a flashback, uh, where the version on the right is telling us things about 
for the version on the left, and then we see mostly this version on the left. Uh, this is Melanie, his sister, and she gets married to Orly, and uh, so we see them frequently throughout the book, and then this is his girlfriend, this is Tolan's girlfriend for some time, Gender Reigns, and uh, we see her usually drawn kind of head on like this. Um, you know, even with these little character sketches, I just kind of picked panels that seemed like a good, like straightforward picture of, the, of these different characters. Uh, you can definitely see a difference in the art style comparing this with um, his uh, Howard Cruz's Wendell comics or with the uh, Barefoot's comics. Uh, these are definitely much more detailed, realistic in a way, but also still very stylized. Uh, but stylized towards like a darker, a bit more depth. And and I, when I say dark, I don't mean like thematically. I just mean visually a darker image. Like there's just more ink on the page than there is in other cases. So um, that's the end of my slideshow. I do have uh, lots more to talk about, but as as um, as we've been doing, we'll spend spend most of that. We'll have most of that conversation in person on Wednesday or Friday, and uh, I will give you some things to do on those days if you're not there face to face. Um, I did just to go back to that briefly. I, I liked that idea of giving you all like a task, like a thing to try to figure out if you weren't. Uh, in face-to-face -face just to kind of organize things but this one also might be there's kind of so much in this book um, it is a pretty dense plot like there's still a lot to follow um, there might be uh, might be something like that or might be I don't know, it might be uh, useful just to kind of discuss and respond to different parts of it um, and um, yeah so I'm just kind of watching time and realizing we're just about out so I'm, I'm Starting to wrap things up. Do you have any questions about Underground Comics, about Howard Cruz, about Stuck Rover Baby? Obviously, we'll get into it on Wednesday. But if you have any questions you want to pose and then talk about on the stream, that would be this would be the time to pose them because we're almost out of time. I've been doing a lot of talking. I haven't doing been doing much asking. Is anyone still watching? Is anyone still out there? Yeah, I got 18 viewers still <laughs> according to Twitch. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, or, you know, in the last couple of minutes, just any like overall first impressions of the art style, because I think that's, to me anyway, I, I always kind of see the art first and then I, uh, I start figuring out the words. Um, but yeah, if you have any, have any questions or initial reactions, then uh, love to hear it. Otherwise, you know, we'll wrap things up and then get into it a bit more with a lot more detail throughout the week. Saw somebody typing there for a second, so I'll let you finish your thought, whoever that was, if you if you have one. But um, yeah, like I said, I think I'll make a character sheet just to kind of help us keep track of who's who. So you're welcome. <laughs> All right, so I think I will just wrap it up. I don't see anybody typing anymore. Maybe maybe you are, and of course I can chat online uh, later, but I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap up the stream. So thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful as an introduction, and especially the background on under, Underground Comics. Um, I might show you some more Underground Comics in person. I'm just hesitant to put them on the stream, if that makes sense, uh, because they are they are very interesting, but also very um, uh, very much rated R, or, or worse. So it's, uh, yeah, you gotta be careful. Okay, well, thanks for watching, everyone. I will see you all, some of you all, I will see some of you on Wednesday, some of you on Friday, everyone else, I'll see you online in the meantime. Hope you all are doing well, having a good day. It's a nice, cool fall day. I think the sun's supposed to come out later, so hopefully it'll warm us up a little bit. Um, but if you can, if you have a chance to, get out and enjoy some of the fall colors. It looks beautiful around town if you're in Fredericksburg or wherever you are, probably. You should have some nice fall color going on. Um, I, I'm really enjoying my backyard. I mean, overall, we had a really wet summer, and so that usually indicates a really colorful fall, and that's what we're, we're starting to see pretty well uh, demonstrated. So uh, get out and enjoy it if you can. Okay, thanks for watching, everyone. I'm going to wrap it up here. I will see you later. Bye.